Mm -hmm. I had a thought that passed through my mind today that I was curious for your take on. Yeah. So what is, what is your conceptualization of um, commitment in like the proper noun kind of sense of like relationships? Like when, like sometimes people aren't committed to a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And then making a commitment is kind of a, a milestone in most narratives. You know, okay. there's how people treat relationships when they're not making a commitment. And then there's that decision to commit is like a momentous kind of thing. I was wondering if you had a, if you agreed with that and if you did, like what do you think it is that's like the, the tipping, like what's the cusp, what's the, what separates one side of that milestone from another? Off the top of my head, I would say personal maturity. I think it has less to do with the other person and more to do with your readiness or commitment. Um, because I, I don't believe that there's one person for everyone. You got to find the special person. I think you have to be prepared to negotiate and um, work with a partner to be able to commit. But I think it's that, I think once you have reached that point of personal maturity or you convince yourself that you're ready, um, so maybe you're not necessarily mature enough, but you think you are, that's kind of when the commitment step happens. Because I, I honestly was not ready for commitment until I was 27 when I was 27. That was the point that I felt mature enough and ready for a type of, ready for looking for the relationships to which I would commit. Because okay. before that point, I was in like the learning phase. I feel you on that, but I feel like uh, readiness to commit is a precursor to the actual decision to commit, which is what yeah. I'm curious about. Yeah. So. So that's, but you, you need to have that first step because otherwise you're going to just continue to look for relationships that are never going to lead to commitment because you aren't ready. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Right. I mean, and then once you get in the relationship, right. So you're continuing to, to test new relationships, right? Once you get in one, you're like, okay, this one looks like it hits all my mar all my boxes. And, and this depends highly again on, on the individual and their level of readiness. And they're like, this looks like it meets enough of my requirements that I then commit to the relationship. And that commitment, it really depends on how you define it. So like when Jen and I got together, we, like, we were only together for like two and a half months before we got married, which is not something I advocate for because if people have time, they should take it. But in that time, we spent nearly every single day, all day long, with the exception of times that we did actual work, talking about how it was that we were compatible or incompatible. And we determined that we wanted to be together, that it was highly probable that we would get married, um, regardless the amount of time we spent together. And therefore, we chose to commit to each other at that point. Right. So that is the part I'm curious about. Like what distinguishes pre-commitment to post-commitment? The choice to commit. It's really just the choice. No, it's like, that's not, that's cheap. Like anybody can say, I commit, you know, they can like make a choice and then it turns out, oh no, you sucked at that. You didn't actually do it. Like what did they do wrong? It's like after the fact, you can say, nah, you didn't do it right. Well, again, I, I think it has to do with with that, that personal maturity, um, when you make the choice to commit, what, what I think you're doing in your head is that you have weighed the odds based on the information you have available to say, um, I think this relationship will last however long, infinity, essentially, until we die. 
And once you've made that decision, or, or you have you've processed that information, you're like, okay, I think this relationship will last. Then you ask yourself the question, am I ready to be in one relationship for ever? And then you, if you answer yes to that question, then you get to the third question is, am I willing to negotiate things that will be less than exactly what I want? So basically, is there mutual benefit for me in engaging this, with this relationship and negotiating on things that maybe I want to do, but the other person doesn't want to do? And that at that at that point you basically I, I guess you basically convince yourself that commitment is worthwhile. That making the promise to this person provides the mutual stability where you don't have to I don't know, like to me, commitment is, is not about like the formality of marriage. Like there, in the military, people get married more often than not because it's the rules require it, right? So if I want my family to move with me, and especially when we were both active duty, if I want that to be consideration, we have to be married. And therefore that legally entangles our fortunes and whatnot. But there's no real, to me, there's nothing different about being married and not married. It's just di more difficult to extract yourself. Right. Yeah, I'm, I mean, from the, from the promise that like you make to the other person, like legally there's clearly a difference in tax purposes, right. Right? but in terms of the commitment, you like the, the verbal promise that you make to the other person, to me, there's no difference. You're either dedicated to the relationship and making it work or you are not. So that's kind of what I'm thinking of in terms of commitment is that concept. It's not something where it's necessarily that you're married, just that you are committed. Right. Yeah. We're going for like defining it without reusing the word. Right. So restate your original question again and I'll see if I can get after it. What, what is it that distinguishes pre-commitment from post-commitment? Um, and not, or, or what distinguishes like a real commitment from a not real commitment. Like if somebody, no. like if you have like a 14 year old who's like, but I'm in love, I'm going to commit. Usually people are like, eh, you're kind of stupid. You're not really committing. Like, this is not what you think it is. Well, that word doesn't mean what you think it means. Yeah. Um, and then you'll have people like later who are very clear on what it means. Right. And they'll like usually be reluctant to get into it. Yeah. They actually know it's clearly a big deal and they, they see a distinction between pre-commitment and post-commitment. So I would say the difference between pre and post-commitment, because I think those are two different questions, is a formal promise that you articulate to the other person. I think that is the difference between the two states. Um, and that's basically it. There, there is no clear objective state that a person or a couple are in that that identifies the shift between one to the other because there really is no difference people are together before they're together after but it is a formal promise in whatever way is formal um, for that couple that is what determines commitment now whether or not people will remain committed Again, that goes back to the qualities of the individual making the decision to commit. Can you unpack the word formal a little bit? Because I, I think you don't mean what I would think formal would mean, which would mean like outside structures, like marriage is a formal structure. Like it's defined by a system. It's got rules. It's written yeah. down in a book. So I don't think you meant that by formal. I mean, so what I mean by formal is a clear declaration of intent to commit. So like is it possible to do that wrong though? Like, is it possible to think that you're being doing it right and making a commitment and then later to be like, Oh, I didn't actually like mean that. And it turns out you did it wrong or is the. So, so I, I yes. I, I think that is, I, I think if you, if you just, 
you can always be wrong, right? So we're human. There's nothing that says, oh, this is true commitment. I mean, true commitment is only can only be determined at the end, right? If it went until one person died, if that's what you're determining as being committed. A follow through can only be determined at the end, for sure. I mean, it's the same. If you didn't follow through on your commitment, then you didn't commit. Well, like, okay, let's say somebody told you, I'm going to commit, and you were curious whether or not they were actually committing, what would you use to try to figure out whether or not they were actually committing? So again, I don't, I don't think there's an, an objective test that you can prove, right? You would, you'd have to have, it's really through conversation, right? And if, and they have to be honest enough to answer that conversation truthfully for you to make any determination. Yeah. So let's assume you have a conversation and they're trying their best to be honest. What would, what would you shoot for? Like, what would you dig into? Um, usually when it comes to compromise. So you say, okay, um, you want to commit to this, this relationship. Um, tell me, you know, sometimes you, you just ask about their, their situation. Like, tell me about uh, conversations that you've had about serious topics, right? And they might tell you about kids and what they want. And um, then you ask them, well, what does your partner want? Ideally, they should know those things. That's a good flag, right? So if they know those things, if they know what the negotiation is, um, ideally, and I've done this with people that I've done weddings for, add it with both people in the room and say, all right, tell me about this. Where are your points of conflict? Um, how have you worked to resolve conflict up to this point? And um, what would you be willing to give up, basically? So, like, what are, what are you interested in? What are you interested in, person one and person two? Okay, in this situation, such and such wants to do this. What are you willing to compromise? Right? And usually if there are some people that it's for really clear, it's like, well, I don't need to compromise anything. You know, that's, that's a clear indicator that they're not truly committed to that relationship. Um, But people aren't always honest because people are very, very afraid of being alone. Yeah, yeah. Assuming, assuming honesty. So, so a lot of times, that honestly, they are, are fooling themselves more than they're fooling their partner. Um, but I, as far as I know, that's really the only way to get after is to have a conversation about, you know, have them define commitment. You know, ideally, there are words like sacrifice, negotiate, compromise. Um, and for them to understand that that is the case is important, um, because when you, when you when we go back to our discussion about morality and ethics, right? Morality is individual. We all have our morals of what is right and wrong for us based on our assumptions and what we've determined to be advantageous. But ethics is the compromise of morality, and then law, of course, is the formalization of that, where um, people lose out on individual advantages, doing whatever you want doing the thing that's most advantageous to you for the good of the partnership, company, organization, country, whole, humanity, et cetera. So that's what commitment is really all about. I'm committed to being, you know, whatever it is, a, a citizen or um, partner. Yeah, it seems like some, some solid indicators are um, like I'm listening to Thomas Sal right now, which is economics, but the dude has a lot of philosophy in there too. And it seems like a reasonable, like one point he keeps coming back to about uh, decision-making systems is that like a naive approach to decision-making systems is to name them based on the hoped for result from them. Um, and a more mature approach to it is to name them based on the process they actually follow to achieve a result. Right. And it seems like that was rolling around in my head as like a way to sort of understand commitment. Like it seems like people that are, you know, you sort of describe them as mature or wor or worldly or wise, or they've been through the shit or something like those people, they tend to talk. I think like you were saying, like more in terms of like, what am I going to do? And then like, 
the approach where it seems like they're young or they're inexperienced or immature, they tend to talk about what they expect to get out of it. Like, like what the end result will be, right? Like if someone says, you know, we'll be together forever. Yeah. And like, Hmm, that, I mean, maybe Probably if, that's the thing, if that's the only thing you're talking about, then like, it means you don't quite know what you're talking about because yeah. people that have been through it tend to talk about it less like we'll be together forever and more like I'm willing to compromise and not get exactly what I want. All and, the time. Yeah. and that it's work and it takes energy. So, um, yeah, so I, li I like the, the, the phrasing of the process because the process of commitment as opposed to the outcome of commitment, the process of commitment is work, discipline, compromise. That's the process. So if you describe commitment by the process, that's how you would describe it. Um, right. Like you have to reaffirm it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes up a lot, obviously, in uh, relation, uh, romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. But it seems like the same basic idea applies to any kind of relationship between multiple actors. Yep. Like an actual commitment. It doesn't have to be called a commitment, you know, but it has to be the, the concept, I think, is something along the lines of I'm going to take my priorities and set them as, like, less important than this shared priority. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily have to be less important, um, but it doesn't necessarily, um, but it basically means that you take your priorities out of primacy, right? That your priorities are not always number one, that they may sometimes be subordinated or sometimes need to um, be on equal footing, right? But yep. there, there are elements of sacrifice in there. Right, I don't think priorities can be on equal footing. I don't think that's how they work. Um, so I, I get what you're saying in a given moment, you have to choose one thing, right? Um, but when you think about like, so competing priorities, so if you have an introvert and an extrovert, uh, you can have, you can both have the priority to, um, recuperate energy, right? And that means that for the extrovert, they want to go out and for the introvert, they want to stay in roughly. And so, there needs to be a balance. It doesn't need to be a perfectly harmonious balance, but there needs to be a balance where both people get some of what they want. So that's what I meant by, by equal. Um, not that one automatically, you know, trumps the other, like, Oh, we're always going to go out or we're always going to stay in because that's what I need. But that there, there will be a match between that priority of going out and staying in to a degree. Yeah, so that's good. That's a good segue. Something that I wanted to run past you to get your take on it is a concept that I picked up from politics and that I find useful in a bunch of other places is the idea of an intangible third party that gets like abstractly created when there's an agreement between multiple parties, because um, like that's sort of how uh, like you know politics can work, right? Like the people as a private noun is like an abstract um, power entity that can be created when you need it and then destroyed when you don't so that you can uh, put the power somewhere. So um, in the sense of committing to something, it's kind of like uh, the relationship itself becomes a thing that has priorities and then its priorities are higher than either individual's priorities. Mm. So it's not yeah. that, that's why like you two are on an equal footing, but that's because you both subordinate your priorities to the relationship itself, like to the maintenance of the relationship, not right. to, and like, that's where I think a lot of people go wrong is they just think of it as two parties. They're like, there's my priorities and your priorities and we, something's got to give. And you get like Elon Musk's I'm the alpha quote. Yeah. Um, where that's where there's only two possibilities, two actors. But if there's a third entity, right. You know, like the relationship, like an abstract idea that, whatever helps the relationship can take priority over either of us. Yeah. And that goes back to finite and infinite games in a finite game. Um, you either win or lose, but in an infinite game, both parties get to keep playing. So, um, that's an interesting framework of a 
intangible third party. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. In a sense, the game itself takes priority over the players. Mm -hmm. That if you have to give something up to keep the game going, you do it. Yeah. Yep. I was actually just talking about finite. So apparently, Simon, Simon Sinek has a new book coming out in November, and it's about finite and infinite games. Okay. And um, Colonel Halfhill, who works here and does leadershipy stuff, apparently knows him, like has his number, and can text him. Um, and she said she was going to give him a hard time for not letting her know that he's writing another book. But uh, she thought it was going to be about like millennials or safety. Um, I'm not sure safety in what regard, but um, she saw that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm familiar with Finite and Infinite Games. And I don't think he's necessarily gone into it that much. But, you know, we've discussed there are a bunch of other people that have talked about Finite and Infinite Games. Yep, I've definitely seen it you know, pop around the thought space. Yeah, that's what, I was, that's what I was telling her. I'm like, there are a lot of people around that space that are talking about that concept. Yeah. It hasn't, it's not mainstream yet, um, but it is among the people who are a little bit mainstream. It's sort of like uh, instrumental music, right? Like the public doesn't listen to instrumental music, but musicians listen to instrumental music. Right. It seems like, like such a straightforward concept like I, it's a great I like the labels for it because it's you know game theory and very you know sort of academic and esoteric so it appeals to me mm -hmm. but it's something that I've been thinking about for a long time in terms of economics when it comes to uh, quarterly returns like to me quarterly returns and stock prices have been incredibly short-sighted um, and it's interesting because they were just set in place to guarantee some sort of um, transparency, right, for organizations to help prevent things like crashes. And yet, at the same time, they incentivize certain behaviors that cause more short-term behavior. So I've always been interested in the companies that have much more longer-term approaches to business. So I'm interested to see kind of where people go as this takes this idea, this terminology takes hold of the infinite games. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a very general purpose model. Like once you yeah. once you grok it, you're like, oh, that explains so many different things. Yeah, like that structure. Well, and, and like the whole thing with with the church and humanity, like that's the ultimate infinite game. Yeah, last question style. Yeah. So how do we how do we perpetuate the game of humanity? Yeah, that's just that's the persistence of meaning thing. It's yeah. just you know, the goal is just um like when I was in grade school, we would take these little strips of paper and make them into links and then we'd make like a chain, a paper chain. Mm -hmm. And it's like how long can you make this chain? It's basically just that's it. It's like what's the purpose of life? It's like, well, you know, you just you just keep this like chain going. Like you somebody handed you the chain and you keep adding little links to it and then you hand it off to somebody else and you just never stop doing that. You just do it forever. I don't know if that's like the purpose, but more like the result. There is no purpose. Well the the purpose is to do your part to ensure that there's somebody to hand it off to. You know, next. Because that part is hardly guaranteed. Oh, yeah. But that's the thing for me is the purpose isn't just procreation. Because, like, let's say the whole thing wasn't fun, right? That you gained no. Yeah, no, okay. I didn't specifically mean uh, reproducing biologically. I just meant, like, abstractly having someone to carry on the meaning that you built up and that you inherited from previous people. Kids are playing with you. Like, I don't remember the name of the story, but my brother keeps telling me a synopsis of it. So I guess I have to read it someday where there's like an asteroid or something headed for the earth. I don't remember exactly what, Oh no, or maybe it was like a gray goo outbreak. 
And so it turns out just because this is what was happening, there was like a super intelligent um, consciousness that had been designed, like the internet, had, it had emerged spontaneously and it was just like, it hadn't told anybody about itself. Um, but then there was like this nuclear explosion or Grey Goo outbreak or something that was gonna destroy the entire earth. And so this thing like really quickly um, built uh, like 3D scanners um, and then it like started scanning humans and digitizing them and broadcasting them like to Alpha Centauri or something. And then um, it, it snagged like the smartest people it could get and it's like held on to their scans. And then like the earth got, you know, the, the destruction finished and there was nothing left there. And so it like woke up all the smart people that it scanned and it said, um, like I broadcast the what I could of the human race uh, towards this star. So you have like X amount of time to figure out how to travel faster than light so that we can catch them. Mm. That sort of thing, like that's that, you gotta just keep the game going, man. Like if you have to throw a long pass, cause yeah. you know, you're out of options, then you throw a long pass and you just gotta make it work. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm starting to think, think about like geoengineering because People, people are too stuck in the, in the finite games. They're like, well, we have to make our quarterly target. It's like, you could do that, or we could have a temperate planet in the future. But I mean, you know, choice is yours. Yeah. And so like, I know we've talked before about, you know, we'll figure something out. We'll do, there'll be some technological advance. Um, and that probably will be true, but you know, what, deleterious effect will that have but well we all get cancer earlier because there's air pollution and that's the only way for us to block out the sun you know what what's it going to take solar reflectors well actually cooling the planet down as, as i heard the math on that is really simple all you got to do is take uh i don't know like sulfur silica particles or something and load them up into balloons and just start spraying them into the atmosphere. And they'll reflect away sunlight. Apparently it happens every time there's a volcanic eruption, naturally. Mm -hmm. And all you gotta do is just go do that. Yep. You know, like apparently you don't actually need very much to make a noticeable impact on how much sunlight is reaching the earth and therefore warming it up. Yeah, the but, question, um, like yeah, a pretty the, big responsibility to take. It is. And, and that's the thing is, you know, who gets to make that choice? You know, yeah. some countries want it to be warmer, other countries not so much. Um so. Yeah. And that won't even help with uh, a rising sea level or something, right? They're disconnected. Um, you know, like seventy percent of the human race lives right next to the water. So like the water continue. rises, it doesn't matter how hot the place is. It, you know, your, your feet are wet. Yeah. I've always, for a long time, I've been curious if we would move or if we would just build a bunch of walls like Louisiana style, like just, or uh, um, Venice, right? Like just stay there and just get a bunch of boats. Just be really like stubborn about it. I mean, it's realistically, I mean, there'll be people who can't move because they're too poor. Um, and then there'll be people who are too stubborn and then there'll be a bunch of people who are dead. So. Cause you know, like what happens to the foundation of skyscrapers in New York when all of a sudden everything is flooded? How long do they hold up? How do those buildings hold up? What's the power infrastructure like? How do you redo that? You can. I mean, there are ways. But maybe you can just get like big sticks and prop them up. Carbon carbon nanotubes, man. Yeah. Maybe you can just put like a really big balloon and tie it to the top of the building. Good. <laughs> 
But anyway, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Well, that's one of the things is I do think we need to get smarter about it. Yeah, I think we're kind of past the whole like do something about it option though, right? So the Paris Accords, did you see like recently they, they put out benchmarks for the Paris Accords and only five countries out of the whatever, however many, 40 something are even halfway to their mark and they're supposed to be at their mark in two years for carbon emissions. That's, I can't say that's surprising. No, not at all. And the Paris Accords were actually based on the best case scenario, which is if they met these things, that the earth would recover in the best case. Yeah, like I said, I think just from a you know layman's following of the subject, it sounds like we're kind of past the part where we're going to be able to avoid um, side effects. Yeah. I don't, I can't think of like a historical parallel to the implications of how big a, a deal feeling the effects of climate change would be. Because at least not within recorded history, I guess, that we would actually have written down and we could refer back to. Yeah. Because it's sort of like a giant war, kind of, except that you can't end it. Like, I'm curious, um, you, you've heard of the Fukuyama's The End of History, right? I've heard of it. I don't think I've read it. Um, read it back during the academy. His, his basic thesis is that liberal democracy is the end of history, you know, mm. in, in all capital letters, in the sense that history is the pr procession of one political system after another trying to find a, a better one. Then liberal democracy is the end of that process, so that's the end of history and mm -hmm. uh, a big part of his argument was that there have been more liberal democracies um, in the world ever since it was invented and no two liberal democracies have ever gone to war against each other mm -hmm. that's the majority of the argument as i remember it sounds like an argument from history yeah yeah, yeah. no history happened you know until when the world becomes fully liberally democratic, then that'll be the end of history. You know, there's still some history going on because there's still some countries holding out and not becoming liberal democracies. Um, and going backwards. So. Hmm? Then there are some going backwards. Yeah, yeah. So like the idea is that there's one end point, but there's like an infinite number of ways to, to not reach it quite yet. That was his, his argument. It took him a whole book to say it, but that was basically it. Um, or I, I might have been too too raw to actually like grab any of the subtleties. Uh, but so like that being like his observations aren't wrong. You know, he's, he's always been right about that is that we still haven't had like an obvious war between two liberal democracies. And um, like it makes me really curious, you know, if we get to like some giant disaster kind of thing or especially like sporadic disasters sort of randomly happening in different places. Like, is the world, is the humanity in a better place now to where, you know, our reaction to stuff going obviously downhill might be, you know, more, more infinite game style. Where maybe, maybe we've learned a bunch of lessons collectively and we'll tend, maybe we'll be able to react um, better rather than just turn on each other and start, you know, thinking in quarters. Yeah. I mean, obviously there will be that element of it because if you're drowning, you're drowning and you don't really care about anything else.
but like for example, you know, you tend to think, oh, the United States and China and Russia would like fight each other, right? Except that they're all like major trading partners with each other and you know, like we hold each other's currency and, and stuff. And so it would actually be kind of, it would hurt any one of those superpowers to turn on the others. Yeah. Like it would hurt them bad. We're, we're heavily, we're more and more integrated every day. So like if bad stuff starts happening in America, like tons of hurricanes or mole people or something, then it would make a lot of sense for China and even Russia to prop us up come help out I was curious if we're like if that if that end of history argument has some actual predictive power to it like if we're actually in a different place having a lot of liberal democracies then 